Okay, these are the solved problems for chapter 13. Take a second to read this. So we're looking for the force on A from particle B. We're going to use Newton's universal law of gravitation on this. Big G, mass of the two objects divided by their distance of separation squared. Don't forget to square it. That's a common mistake. We know that 6.67 times 10th and negative 11th, that's Newton's gravitational constant. The mass of A is 2, the mass of B is 2, and the distance between A and B is going to be 0.4 meters. So don't forget to square that guy. You peck all that into your calculator and you're going to come up with 1.668 times 10 to the negative 9, 9 newtons. So the force is pretty small. Now the force due to particle C on A is going to have the same thing. It's going to be big G, mass of C, mass, mass of A. Just a second here. Big G, mass of C, mass of A, mass of C divided by the distance to C, quantity squared. So again, 6.67 times 10th and negative 11th, that's big G, Newton's gravitational constant. Mass of C, mass of A, they're both 2. And now they're 0.1 meter apart. So let's square, make sure I square that guy. And I'm going to come up with 2.669 times 10th and negative 8 Newtons. And I will make this guy negative because I'm expecting that force to be in the negative x direction. And the force is still quite small, but much larger than the force we experience from B. B and C are the same mass. The, really, the difference between them is, is A is simply closer to C. So we ex expect the force to be larger. Now the net force on A is simply going to be the force of B plus the force of C. And you peck those guys into your calculator and you come up with a negative 2.5 times 10 to the negative 8th newtons. All this really says is the force is, sorry, not to the right, to the left, towards C. Let me take this one a step further and make it similar to a lecture problem you're going to see. Suppose I asked you the velocity after it has had traveled for one centimeter, and you know the force is towards C, you know that it's going to travel towards C there. We cannot use our kinematics equations because the force is constantly changing. It depends on radius squared. What we can do is we can use conservation of energy to say the kinetic energy plus the potential energy initially must be equal to the kinetic plus the potential energy afterwards. And initially I'll say it was you know, taken from rest. And if I define my potential energy to be zero right here at the starting point, then I can figure out um, the kinetic energy and the potential energy from A and B. Well, the kinetic energy is simply mass velocity squared. That's going to be related to our velocity. That's what we want to solve for. It's going to get potential energy from both B and from C. So I can calculate what that is using the, um, using the equation for potential energy that we have now for this chapter. The potential energy from C is going to be big G, mass of C, mass of A divided by the radius to C not squared this time and I forgot the negative I'm defining it to be a gravitational potential well so if I just go ahead and I plug all these guys into my calculator 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11th and then mass of C is 2, mass of A is 2, I'm just going to square that guy and now my radius is 
forgot my negative, and I'm going to come up with a negative 2.69 times 10 to the negative 9th joules. Now for a, U2 from particle B, now I'm moving further away from B. What that means is my potential energy should um, become closer and closer and closer to zero. It should increase from the negative well of B. So I'm going to say that this potential energy is going to be positive. And it's again going to be G, mass of B, mass of A, divided by the radius to B, not squared again. So 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11th. I've got my masses right there. And now it's going to be 0 0.41 meters, not squared. And I'm going to come up with 5.23 times 10 to the negative 10th joules for this guy. So if I add these two guys together, my potential energy is going to be U2A plus U2B. I'm going to get negative 2.437 times 10 to negative 9th joules. Now, coming back up to my expression right there, 0 is equal to K2 plus U2. Now, K2 is going to be negative U2. So negative negative is going to give me a positive 2.437 times 10 to the negative 9th joules. And now 1 half mass velocity squared is going to be equal to that number right there. So velocity is going to be the square root of 2 times 2.437 times 10 to the negative 9th divided by the mass of the object, that's going to be 2. And I'm going to come up with a very, very, very small velocity, 6.98 times 10 to the negative 6 meters per second. Take a second to read the problem. It's a mass on a spring problem. We know that it's oscillating back and forth at 1.33 hertz, and the mass is 0.75 kilograms and it says what's going to happen when you add or subtract mass so how is the frequency going to change so to solve this problem and it says try to do it without finding the spring constant we know that the frequency is related to 1 divided by 2 pi and we're going to have the spring constant divided by the mass. If I take this expression and I multiply both sides by the square root of mass, I'm going to get the frequency multiplied by the square root of mass is equal to the square root of the spring constant divided by 2 pi. And I know that the spring is never going to change in this problem. I'm just playing around with my mass. So what I've just circled there in blue is always going to be a constant. What that means is the product of the frequency and the square root of the mass must also be a constant. If the mass increases, the frequency will correspondingly go down and vice versa. So I can take my known frequency and my known mass and apply that to say that that number, that product, is always going to be a constant. So I can use the knowledge that I have of frequency and mass to figure out the frequency at later dates if I happen to know the mass. So I'm interested in the frequency at some later time. That's going to be equal to the initial frequency and then the square root of the initial mass divided by the mass at the later date. So if I add 0.22 kilograms to my 0.75 kilograms, then my mass 2 is now going to be equal to 0 
kilograms. So my frequency would then be 1.33 hertz, my known value right there. And the square root of the initial, or the square root of the initial mass, 0.75 divided by 0.97, and I'm going to come up with 1.17 hertz and it decreased just just like I expected. Now if I go ahead and I subtract the mass off then my mass 2 is then going to be 0 0.75 minus 0 0.22 0 0.53 kilograms. Make sure I get my units in there. So my frequency then will be my known frequency 1.33 hertz and then point 75 my initial mass, mass 1, and then 0.53, and I'm going to come out with 1.58 hertz, which is larger than the initial frequency. I've decreased my mass, so it's kind of everything has behaved the way that I've expected. Okay, take a second to read the problem. Here I have an acceleration versus time graph, and I know that the acceleration is going to behave like the omega squared multiplied by the amplitude multiplied by the cosine of omega plus some phase angle right there. I know that that's the functional form of this graph. And I also know that the functional form of the position versus time graph is simply going to be the amplitude and then cosine omega t plus that phase angle right there. So here I have an expression for the position versus time, and here I have one for the um, acceleration versus time, and we got those by taking derivatives of the position and velocity. So we can also say that the acceleration is going to be the um, simply the angular or negative angular velocity squared multiplied by the position versus time. They're going to share all of the other, all of the same properties. So I can go and I can look off of this graph right here and look how long does it take to make one full cycle. And I can say I see that the period is going to be 0 0.2 seconds. And I know that there's a relationship between the period and the mass. The period is going to be equal to 2 pi square root of mass divided by the spring constant. And I also know what the spring constant is. Convert that over to meters, newtons per meter. I'm going to come up with 250 newtons per meter. So I'm just going to go ahead and solve this guy for the mass. So t multiplied by the square root of the uh, spring constant divided by 2 pi must be equal to the square root of the mass. So if I go ahead and I square that guy, that must be equal to the mass. So that's going to give me 0 0.2, that's my period. It's going to be squared. And then I'm going to have my spring constant, 250. The square canceled out the uh, square root there. And then 2 pi. And I'm going to come out with a mass of 0 0.253 kilograms. Now to take a look at part B, the maximum displacement, I've, I'm given an acceleration um, graph right here, and I need to relate that to the position graph. I can read off the maximum acceleration, no problem at all. At all. Maximum acceleration is going to be equal to 12 meters per second squared. I can use this expression up here to say, you know what, I know that the maximum acceleration is going to be equal to the omega squared multiplied by the amplitude, where the amplitude is simply the maximum position. And I've disregarded the negative sign because I want the amplitude to come out to be positive. If it was negative, it simply flips the sine or cosine um, upside down. So I've now related the maximum acceleration to the amplitude. And 
I also know that omega is going to be equal to the square root of k divided by m. So I can go ahead and say maximum acceleration, which I can read off the graph, is going to be k divided by m multiplied by the amplitude. The square took care of the square root. And so my amplitude is going to be 12 meters per second squared multiply both sides by the mass which is which I found in the first part 0.253 kilograms divide that by the spring constant of 250 newtons per meter and I get my amplitude to be 0 0.0121 meters. Lastly, I'm asked to find the maximum force, and I know how the force is related to the position, force is equal to kx using Hooke's law. The maximum force will occur when the uh, spring is at the maximum displacement, so force is equal to k multiplied by amplitude. So I got my 250, that's going to be my spring constant. And I know that my amplitude is going to be 0 0.0121 meters. So my maximum force is going to be equal to 3.03 newtons.